participants because we have uh, two very interesting presentations by two uh, professors from Brazil and in particular from Sao Paulo. Uh, Joaquim Guilloto is associated to University of Sao Paulo, but he also works at the OECD in Paris. And as you can see, he's going to give us some additional perspective compared to the presentation we had by Nori last week on those interregional input output uh, tables that the OECD is developing. And then for the talk number two, we're going to have uh, Professor Pedro Sion from uh, Sao Paulo, as I said, and he's going to focus on the impact of climate change on uh, coffee uh, in Colombia. Thank you very much to both of you for being available for us. And then Joaquim, you can take it from here whenever you're ready. Well, I think I'm ready. Very uh, good. First of, all, first of all, I want to, to thank you, Sandy. Uh, uh, Edward and the, uh, all the, the people for, for the invitation. It's always a pleasure to be real, even if virtually. Uh, of course, I would like very much to be there at Illinois, but uh, anyway, uh, life sometimes is, uh, has some things you have to live with. But anyway, now uh, what I'm going to present today is uh, the complement the the presentation did by, by Nori uh, some weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago. So actually, I'm going to, to give you more uh, overview of the work we do at the OECD in terms of destination of the global input of the databases, the intercountry input of well, input of databases and the indicators we have now in place, the trade value added, the the CO2 emissions in boring trade and the um, trade employment and there are some other indicators we are working with. And um, I'll talk about the release you are going to do this year with a new update in the database. So you can have an idea of the, the kind of data we have at OECD that might be of interest for your working in, in terms of uh, regional economics and environmental uh, questions. Um, okay, so uh, I'll talk about the first about the CIO and then the, the indicators we have in place and the new indicators we are working with and probably we will be releasing uh, also this year. Uh, the trade in tourism and also the uh, energy indicators. That's a little bit uh, different concept. These uh, energy indicators is a joint work I'm doing with the IA, the International Energy Agency. Uh, and they'll talk a, a little bit about this work. And uh, I will present some final remarks. So this year we're going to release soon, about maybe in the next two months. Uh, the next version of the intercountry output of tables uh, that has some spe specific characteristics and um, more up to date and more industries and more countries. So this 2021 release uh, will be covering 67 economies, actually in six, six countries and the rest of the world. Uh, we are increasing the detail of industries we released from 36 to 45. And you are now uh, back, uh, because the last release we had from 2005, 2015. And now we are coming, going back to 1905 and to 2018. Uh, maybe this going back to 1905 uh, won't be for every year from 1905 to 20. 2005 at the first moment, but uh, we see what it's possible to do. Uh, but the, the, the idea is to have the whole annual series from 95 until 2018 for all these economies and the industries. And the ICIO itself, it has a, a very good characteristic that some of the other international databases don't have. Uh, actually, we always benchmark the, our data with the latest official annual national account statistics. So actually, we uh, have a good address to, to the national statistics of the countries. Uh, 
uh, we have make, make distinction between cross broader trade and direct pushage by non residents. So actually, uh, uh, we have estimations to what the people from one country buys in another country, and this is important uh, not only for the effect of the estimation of the matrix itself, but it actually allows for measures in terms of the uh, tourism, not really tourism, because actually some of the 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 um, the push charge is not tourism, but actually the, uh, to see what people buy abroad. And actually, uh, if you are going to, to make estimations for uh, uh, CO2 emissions or even energy from the side of the uh, consumption side or production side uh, indicators, uh, that really makes uh, some difference in the estimation. And another characteristic we have that you have a a firm heterogeneity for China and Mexico. So for China and Mexico, we split the, the China and Mexico tables in, let's say, two Chinas and two Mexicos. Uh, the one China that uh, has the industries for uh, processing trade, and the other China that the, the industry is more focused on the national uh, production. Of course, the national production can also export the same for for, for Mexico, but this is important when you are going to measure indicators of uh, trade in value added and indicators of CO2 or uh, employment body trade, because actually uh, when you process for trade, the, the share of inputs and value added are different uh, from the process industry than the export industries and the, also the level of employment and technology use is different. So, uh, we do that to work that actually uh, makes better estimation of trade, mainly for China, that's very important in international trade. And in case of Mexico, is very important for the trade with the USA. Now, this is the list of countries uh, that uh, we are uh, going to, to release pretty soon. Um, uh, we have the 37 uh, OECD countries, that's the ones in yellow. And you also have the, the other countries uh, in, in our database. The new, we have two new countries, Myanmar and Laos, um, the, this new version. And uh, the next version will probably have some more, uh, probably for next year. The idea is to have like updates uh, regularly. Uh, the last one was 2018 and this one is, Supposed to, to be less year, but given the COVID and the out, the circumstances going to, to be this year. Um, so, uh, of course, with the countries who we have, we can, can group them in the, uh, the, the, the regions like the European Union, the Southeast Eastern Asia. OECD, non-OECD, APEC, the G20. So all these uh, regions, we have details in the indicators. So uh, you can make aggregating of the results as much as you like. Uh, for these 66 in, uh, economies, we, we have explicitly data. Uh, the GDP of this uh, the added GDP of these economies is 93% of the world, it exports 92 and imports 9%. It means that the rest of the world is the remaining uh, of the um, of the shares you know, of these economies. Okay, I'll just speak about the China Mexico. Uh, the industries uh, coverage, that's the, the new one we are going to release. The previous one was the 36 industries. Uh, now we have, in terms of novelty, uh, we have the pharmaceuticals split from chemicals uh, in the ICIO. Given this COVID crisis, we think this is a nice feature, so we can do better analysis in terms of trade of the pharmaceutical industry. And they also for the, 
for the transport industry. Now we have a breakdown of the uh, land transport, water transport, uh, air transport, warehouse, and postal, postal and courier. So this is also important uh, information. So in terms of analysis of trade and costs of trade and, and, and transport costs uh, involving trade, I think this will be a nice feature. And there are also some other services we open down. Uh, so we have more now more details for the service sector. So uh, in this way, you can have uh, a better analysis. In terms of now, we have like uh, also agriculture and forestry separate from, from fishing also. So this new feature. Uh, are important in terms of trade and in terms of um, uh, analysis for environment, energy and CO2. Another one is that we split from electricity, from water supply uh, uh, and treatment of water and waste management and so on. So these features, uh, I think we get the, in terms of public release, uh, we get better information how people can do uh, much more analysis of the, the data uh, we, we make publicly available. Um, these are the, the, the aggregates we have in Kiva indicators. Uh, I'll talk about you about more, more about that later on. So actually all these databases, uh, they are in available, freely available in the um, OECD uh, internet and we have the link. Uh, I don't know. I, I can make the, the this PowerPoint available for you later on if you are interested. Uh, I don't know if you have a depository, but uh, uh, I, I can send it to you the, the, the PowerPoint later on. Now, um, a little bit of the, the history of the, the ICAO estimation. Uh, actually, it starts in the 1990s when the SAO started working in terms of harmonizing uh, input output tables. Uh, and then it goes on uh, through time until in the beginning of 2010 uh, with the project in trade in value added indicators, the TV indicators from OECD and WTO. Uh, the first estimation of the IO system uh, was made in the 2013. And after that, we have uh, a release in 2016, uh, a light update, and then we had another one in 2018. And this last one will be, uh, be, be done um, in the coming two months. Uh, and uh, we have new indicators in terms of uh, probably tourism and energy indicators. So the process to build the SEIO is, is not so, it takes a lot of time uh, because actually uh, internally, uh, uh, the, the public release of the SEIO, uh, we made for, we are going to make now for 67 uh, economies and split of national China and 45 industries. But actually, internally, uh, we, we work with a bigger system for 75 industries, 75 commodities. So actually, we, we estimate uh, supply and use tables uh, before we go to the input output tables. So actually, we start with the SNA constraints, just a, a brief overview of the estimation procedure. We start with the SNA constraints. Uh, then we estimate uh, output and value added for industry, uh, output value added for industry and output for industry and product at the level of 75 uh, commodities, 75 industries, and, and um, uh, from different sources of data, national uh, statistics, international organizations, uh, and of course, some estimations. Uh, of course, you don't have this level of information uh, for our industries, for our countries. So we, are, we need also to do some estimation, some interpolation to get that. Uh, the same thing for exports, imports, 
pre exports and imports. So we need to make a balance of the trading in the world. And for the one world trade, you know, that's not easy. And this, uh, this work with exports and imports, this balance is mainly done by, by Nori, it does a wonderful job on that. It's not easy to put everything together. Uh, then we do estimations on the final expenditure component, the final demand, the household, uh, government, investment, and so on. So actually, there is a, a conversation between the exports and imports and the output, because actually uh, the exports needs to be less than the output you do. Uh, the exports are estimated at the commodity le uh, product, product level, so that's why you do the estimation of product uh, uh, at the, the output at product level uh, also. So from the, this block of information, uh, we estimate the use tables. Actually, uh, we use also the use tables from the countries, the international organizations, and they also uh, we have to fill the gaps and the estimate for countries don't have these tables. So it's a huge work that's done on, on this part. Uh, and the thing, uh, to give you the credit, we have a, a, a small thing to, to do this work. Uh, actually, mainly it's, uh, I, I can name the person, it's myself, it's Nori, it's Colin, uh, it's uh, Ali, it's Carmen, Agnes, and Peter, and the famous. So I, I think seven or eight people that actually do all this work. So you can imagine. Uh, after the various part, in part, we have the bilateral trade. So we have the supply and the, uh, a new stable at full charge and basic price. You have the margin estimation for margin. We have the bilateral trade balance. And from this, bilateral trade is in full charge price. So actually, you combine both tables and you get the use tables at basic price and supply. Uh, and from the sub national supply table, you get the ICIO. And from the ICIO, you get the indicator. So that's the estimation procedure. Uh, I just talked. And after doing that, we get the ICIO, that's the overall structure for three countries and two industries, example. So we have the intermediate consumption. Actually, you have the, uh, the tax and products paid by different countries. So in going from push charge price to basic price, actually we know how much tax the imports from country A pays to country B, country C, and country A. So we have this matrix of tax from uh, from the pushage of goods from one country to another country. Uh, we have the direct pushage abroad by residents, and you have the final demand consumption, uh, households, uh, non-profit organizations, um, government, uh, investment, and changing inventory. So this is the structure of the, the data country input output table. And based on that, uh, we estimate the indicators. So the indicators, the estimation of the indicators that are also are publicly available, it comes after the estimation of the ICIO. Um, so the first set of indicators are the, are the trading value indicators that uh, are widely used to, to see, uh, to measure the, uh, actually what's the component of the value added embodied in different goods and services trade in, in the world. So actually, uh, this was a concept developed by the OECD and, and WTO. Uh, and the reason is that when you measure the trade, gross trade, actually you don't see how the countries are interconnected. For that, you need the, the ICIO. Uh, the input output, and here you need also the, uh, uh, the to, to have this system so you can could be able to using the, the input output table uh, to estimate the, uh, the value added embodied in the goods uh, uh, 
exported by the countries or the good and the goods consumed by the final demand of the country. So actually, just to say that I didn't put an equation in the, in the presentation, uh, this is the, the basic system of the, the MTF system. That's a very, very basic. And then from the Leontief inverse matrix, uh, you can use the, the value added coefficient. And from the value added coefficient, you can actually estimate uh, what's the value added in body in the final demand, what's the value added in body in the exports. Uh, but actually, the, the estimation, uh, this is the, the basic uh, uh, equation. But actually, to get the, the domestic value added, the foreign value added body in trade, body in exports, uh, the different components of the indicators, the trade value indicators, of course, you need to work with this matrix in a more complex way. So it's not a state, straightforward way to estimate that. Uh, so you need different ways to break down the, the exports, to work with the inverse matrix, to work with the matrix of coefficient, technical coefficient. So different ways to, to work with the system. So uh, I'm not going into detail because I actually don't have time for that. But there is a publication, is a guide to TV indicators that explain how each one of the indicators is estimated. And actually, we have uh, plus than 50 indicators. We have structural indicators, indicators linking value added with gross export, with final demand, and detail indicators for the ones that actually uh, want to, to do more with the the own estimation. So this is just a list, uh, just for you to have an idea. That's what you call the structural indicators. That's the indicators that uh, measure the value added in gross exports and imports. And they actually here, there is also a, a, a problem of double counting, just as a caveat for you to know, and not to want to discuss, discuss here. And the final demand indicators, of course, uh, by construction, they don't have double count. So these are the most uh, complex indicators that have. Uh, so the previous indicators, we have three dimensions. Actually, if you input or put analysis, you can get to eight dimensions. And they actually, we reduce these dimensions to three dimensions for the basic indicators and to four dimensions to the detail indicators. Uh, so actually, once again, um, just to give you a review, uh, maybe in, uh, sometime we can get uh, a special session uh, on, on the estimation of indicators and the interpretation. So the idea to estimate the trade in body in CO2 and the trade in environment indicators is the same. So instead of using the value added coefficient, you are going to use CO2 emissions coefficient and the employment uh, coefficient. Actually, the, the trade employment not, not, don't have, does not have the only information for, for employment, but also for uh, compensation to the employees. Uh, the point is that uh, it seems simple, but as you saw last time, I mean, for you to estimate the CO2 coefficients and the employment coefficients, there is a, another huge work to do that. So, uh, and part of the work, you no know, represent uh, last time when you spoke about the CO2 uh, indicators, the, the tech, CO2 uh, indicators. So, so some, some results. So, we are. Uh, pretty much uh, close uh, of the time, not of the presentation, <laughs> but I will speed up. Uh, so uh, some indicators for uh, value valued shares, um, like the foreign valued share of total gross exports. So you measure uh, how much of the your exports uh, actually depend on the imports you do. 
uh, that's the domestic value added in body in the foreign export. So how much of the your you you take part in the global value chains by selling inputs to the other countries to, to export. So actually some countries like the Saudi Arabia, because they produce like oil is the, the main produce. Actually, they, they produce in the, the, the oil end up in the exports of the other countries because you, it's used as an intermediate good to produce the other uh, exports. So uh, you can see how countries are really uh, integrating the global value chains. Uh, you can do estimates for regions. So actually from the final demand, uh, like in North America, you can, you can see how much of the value added comes from inside the region and from the European Union, Eastern Southeast Asia, and the rest of the world. And of course, this share is mainly China that increased the share participation of the value added consumption in North America. And you can have that for the, the intra regional, because the, this is inter regional, and the, the, inside the East and Southeast Asia, you can see the increased importance of China from 2005 to 2015. So this is in, in US, uh, billion US dollars. And you can break down the, the value added in borrowing domestic demand for, for industry, like for computers. And you can see what's the source of the, the value added uh, from the different regions uh, in, in, the, um, in the world, okay? Like for South, Saudi Arabia, uh, what's the value added from uh, European Union, North America, China, and so, and so on. This is a nice indicator because actually it shows how much of the, um, the imports of electronics machines and transport equipment. So how much of the imports the US does came from, from Mexico, came from the USA, uh, from Canada. So actually it shows the imports you do from other country, uh, how much value added comes from the different countries in the world. Um, okay. Um, the other indicator is the trade in, in, in profit. That actually the same way shows how much of the the the, the, the business sector actually because actually the, the export of service is not so so big. The, the most part of the exports are goods. But actually, when you export goods, there is indirect service involved in the exports of goods. So actually, um, you, uh, you can measure, here is the, the total export of the countries, that depend, the, the business side depends on the total export of the, the, the countries, but actually you can measure that of the, the employment embodied in the exports of uh, goods, for example, manufacturing. Uh, the CO2 emissions, no talk less time. So you can actually have uh, measure uh, how much emission from the consumption side and the production side. So you can see in the charts uh, that that's the, um, the um, developing countries. So actually they export, uh, this is the, the, ex, the, the production of CO2. So they produce more that they consume, they export. And this is the OECD countries. So actually the OECD countries, they consume more uh, than they produce. So they are net imports of CO2 emissions. Now, uh, just to almost there, uh, these new indicators that uh, we are working on it. So this is the trade in tourism that actually, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, cross border uh, measure pushed by uh, non residents, and you can see, like for the uh, like for, for a country like Greece, about 25% of the value added of, of the exports uh, are associated uh, pushed by non residents. So it's an indicator of countries that actually 
are more dependent on the tourism for exports uh, of their goods and services. So just uh, just to, to finish, uh, this is a project being going on with the uh, international energy agents that actually is to bring to 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 build a hybrid system, uh, taking consideration the ICIO and the flows of energy around the world. So actually it goes in different stages of the work. The first stage is, is the estimation of energy physical suppliers tables based on the energy balance. It means taking the energy, the, the IA energy balance and making supply and use table. And after you have the suppliers table, you combine with the SIO and you get a multi-factor uh, energy input output model in hybrid terms. So it's a, instead of working with the coefficients approach that you have used so far, uh, this uh, we work with the actually uh, a hybrid system that has some advantages in terms of uh, avoiding the question of the relative price of energy paid by different users on one side. And the other side, when you have a physical uh, SUTs energy, you can actually measure how much energy is produced by uh, energy. So it's an additional. Uh, so actually, uh, uh, it's uh, just this uh, uh, hybrid system that actually will provide some energy indicators. Uh, this is supposed, and this is just uh, an example of the indicators and preliminary results. So actually, you can measure, uh, like for the USA, you can measure, like for the construction se sector, how much energy is direct energy, like 10%, how much energy is embodied in the, um, in the inputs used for in the production of the, made by the construction set, uh, sector, like 60% of energy, and the, how much energy is used to produce energy, 30%. So you can have this idea more clearly of the energy, and you can break down by domestic energy, import energy, like the, all the other uh, indicators uh, I just uh, mentioned. So just to finish, uh, almost in time. So this is databases. Uh, are actually freely available. So you can access them, uh, download. Uh, and uh, actually we always try to improve and to have better results and more, uh, uh, more detailed information that you can use in your research and uh, for different uh, analysis uh, and for also policy makers and outside, inside your CD they are uh, widely used. So I don't know if you have time for questions yes, or comments. Yes, we, we do. Yeah, we do. Thank okay. you so much, uh, Joaquim. We told Obligado. Uh, I think what is very nice of this presentation, just like the one of Nori last week, is that um, for, for, you, for, for users like uh, myself, it's very good to understand better <laughs> the amount of work that goes beyond uh, when constructing those input-output database. So I'm very glad you gave us a better explanation of what goes into it. I have two questions for you and a request. So yes. my, first, my first question for you is, could you be uh, a bit clearer with respect to what differentiates the OECD IRIO system compared to other existing IRIO out there, uh, Wired, EORA, Exuvase? I believe that two elements are the fact that you have the value added that is embodied into trade, and you also clearly uh, identify re-import and re-export. As far as I remember, the other ones do not, but I would love you to uh, verify that. My second question, is to what extent, once you are done with building such um, databases, do you verify whether the other ones I cited before will lead to somewhat similar results or not? Maybe you're not allowed to answer on this point, but is there some kind of coordination among all those organizations that are building IRIO system? And then my request is, uh, well, because I like to work very much on the impact of climate change is definitely a question that's... Uh, that is uh, becoming more and more important. 
Uh, is there any chance that we look at other environmental accounts, say water use, eventually other gases beyond CO2? And is it possible at all to consider breaking down agriculture across the different crops? Because the effect of climate change on each crop varies, actually. Uh, so is it, anyway, those are my, my feedback, uh, Joachim. What do you think? Okay, uh, let's try briefly explain uh, to you. Uh, so actually, uh, at USD, we do really do a no reduce, a much excellent job in terms of export and reimports that the other database they, they don't do. Uh, so this is the no recoordinate this part of the, the work. So actually, uh, taking consideration of export and imports that actually not too well taken. Another thing that actually Nori makes sure, and this is very important, is the consistency of the national accounts and the adherence of our database to the national account. So this is a very important features. Uh, we actually have a harmonized system. So some databases does not have a time series of tables like we do. Uh, so, some series like EOR, uh, they have much more countries, but they actually they, they have different level of industries, not a homogeneous level of industry. Uh, that's the work we, we do. Uh, we have the heterogeneity for China and Mesh, the other database uh, they don't have. You have this uh, pushage by non-resident that we have. So actually, and uh, I think right now with this release, our databases will be the one must up to date in terms of the not forecast, but in terms of estimation of uh, real numbers from, from the statistical logs. Uh, of course, we do some forecast also some estimation, but actually we, we do use the information from uh, statistical logs from the, from the United Nations from different sources. So it's a very consistent uh system uh so this might be the uh, the main difference uh, another difference is that some databases uh, they are not consistent time i mean uh, they sometimes they produce sometimes they, they don't and this is a continuous work that has been done and it continues being done by the OECD. Uh, no matter who is there it's an institutional project so you continue to, to go on. Um, and uh, actually, we are improving the destination because actually uh, we have some, as I told you, we have underlying system uh, what is about uh, 108 countries and 75 industries. Uh, we don't release out the information for all the countries on the industries because there is a question of consistency and quality of the data. But actually, this underlying data helps to have a better, better consistent system that we public release and help you. We see where we need to improve and uh, make things better for the next release. Release. Uh, in terms of the coordination of databases, uh, there was a, a movement some years ago that Manfred Lenz stated uh, about putting a joint uh, database uh, of data for people to use. Uh, it didn't evolve so much. Uh, I, I, I don't know if how uh, far that will go because actually there is a lot of work going on and a lot of work people do and somehow we want to, to, to take some profit of the work we do. And sometimes, uh, I mean, you are not, I mean, for your own work, it's good, the data, but you not feel comfortable to, to release. And in some cases, even some institutions, they have some question of confidentiality that you cannot publicly release the data you have. So, uh, so that's uh, one issue. Uh, but anyway, uh, we also, in terms of, the, the work we do ACD, we, we always check the data uh, of the other databases and the other databases and try to understand the differences and try to improve the quality of our estimation. 
uh, in terms of the other gas gases for, for greenhouse gas, as Nori mentioned, uh, our plan is to include uh, as possible the other greenhouse gas. So uh, the idea is for the to change the, the CO2 estimations, CO2 indicators for greenhouse gas indicators uh, by presenting different gas. So this is in, in our working program. Uh, we see how much we can include uh, uh, each time. You know, I mean, the problem won't be possible to, to include everything at once, but uh, little by little be included in the, all the greenhouse gases. And to break down for the, the crops, I mean, uh, uh, that's uh, another work, and uh, no, I understand uh, another yeah. project. Uh, yes, I understand. It's just there is there is some uh, growing request for that, but I understand. I it's different. yeah, but uh, this requires. Well, I mean, everything is possible if you have <laughs> the resource to do it. But uh, yeah, yeah, that's and not you, our. Uh, yeah, yeah, I understand. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Joachim, for those answers. We have time to collect one question for Joachim. Well, if not, then Joachim, thank you. So you ask so the <laughs> I think I ask everything. That's true. So thank you so much, Joachim. Obviously, everybody has access to your email address. So if they want to follow up with you, they can always uh, contact you. Thank you so much. Merci. Obrigado. Okay. Here's my, my email address. Ah, wonderful. Thank Thanks a lot. So we are moving okay. from Paris, France to beautiful Sao Paulo in Brazil with presentation number two by Pedro Sayan. As you can see from uh, the announcement, uh, Pedro is going to speak about uh, the impact of climate change on uh, coffee in Colombia. So why don't we make sure that Pedro can share his screen? Um, Pedro, are you the co -host? Yes, I think you are the co -host. Oh, wonderful, okay. So I can see your screen, uh, Pedro, and uh, um, I'm assuming we can hear you, Pedro? Uh, can everybody oh, yeah. hear me? Okay, yes, we can hear you just fine. So yeah, you're good to go. Thank you so much, Pedro. Okay, so first of all, thank you very much for the invitation, for being here. Uh, thank you, Joaquin, for your presentation before mine. And Sandy and Eduardo for inviting me to be here presenting in the Rio Seminar series. Okay, so this is the title of my work. It's called Boiling Hot, Economy-Wide Impacts of Climate Change on Colombian Coffee Yields, pun intended. Um, this is the research team that was involved in this project. Uh, this is actually a subproduct of uh, Eduardo's course, a graduate course called uh, Input Output Systems and Computable General Equilibrium Models. And so the students had to, this was, uh, this course was held on the second semester of 2019, and the students had all to choose a topic regarding Colombian economy in order to write a paper about. But later on, Eduardo decided to uh, not to publish those papers, but actually to co compile them into a book that's probably going to be published by Springer uh, later on. Okay, so I'm gonna be speaking about uh, those topics. Firstly, I'm gonna be depicting a distinction between climate change and global warming. There is a common misconception in which people usually uh, employ those terms as if, if, if they were interchangeable, in which case they are not. Uh, I'm gonna speak a little bit about Colombian coffee industry history. Then I'm gonna describe the harvesting mechanisms and how climate change affects them. A little description about the, the computable general equilibrium shock. I'm not going to be uh, getting into detail about the model structure, but once the book, book is published, it's going to be thoroughly uh, described in an, in an entirely chapter dedicated uh, only for it. And lastly, I'm going to go for some final remarks. Okay, so I chose to start the, the presentation with the sentence from Mark Twain. So if you don't like the weather in New England, just wait a few minutes. Uh, it's a little funny, but the thing is, it, it uh, helps to illustrate the difference between weather and climate. So weather refers to atmospheric conditions that occur locally over short periods of time. So when we take a look at our apps, for example, in our phones to, to see if it's going to be rainy, sunny, and the temperature of the day, that's weather. Uh, as I said, familiar examples include rain, snow, cloudiness, windiness, and so forth. Climate, on the other hand, uh, refers to the long-term regional or even global averages of uh, such atmospheric conditions. 
So climate change actually is a physical phenomenon in which there are globally long lasting shifts in temperature, precipitation, cloudiness among those uh, previously mentioned atmospheric conditions. Um, such variation, and of course, uh, as climate is also uh, subject to uh, randomness, not necessarily a change from one year to another uh, depicts climate change. Uh, what is important here is long lasting. So to see if there is a pattern or a trend that happens uh, again and again over time. So such variations may be caused by many different reasons, uh, not necessarily as uh, most people think humankind. Uh, but more recently, uh, the, the intervention of, of uh, human activity on climate change has sparked a global discussion regarding its effects. So I just I chose uh, this graphic from uh, the NASA's Goddard Institute for Space Studies to illustrate the impact of human activity on specifically global warming. And global warming here is only one of, of, uh, of the aforementioned uh, consequences from climate change in which it uh, only affects temperature. I could have put here actually the global emissions. Uh, I actually put it on the on the manuscript, but as if we see uh, the, the trend of emissions uh, across time, it actually also uh, uh, almost perfectly emulates the pattern of, of temperature only if a couple of decades prior due to the lag component in, in, in this kind of phenomenon. So uh, what about coffee and what about Colombia? So coffee first appeared in Colombia by the mid 18th century when the Jesuits introduced in its forms in the Eastern Plains. It remained a major crop, not only in this country, but all over the world. It was considered a spice and it wasn't consumed uh, in such a large industrial scale as it is nowadays. Uh, as I said, now, by the late 19th century, with the advent of industrial revolution began the real history of coffee, of the coffee industry. Still in Colombia, even though it became as a subproduct of the pinnacle of coffee growing in Venezuela and Andes, it still remained a minor and marginal activity. On the first decades of the 20th century, uh, even though uh, Colombia was exper experiencing a rough period given the greatest civil conflict in Colombian history, it yielded a surprisingly uh, growing um, productivity in this crop and thus it started to, to, to depict itself as, as what it is today. From in, like mostly on the first half of the 20th century, it started to grow steadily until it became what it is mostly nowadays. So what it is nowadays, Colombian coffee is renowned worldwide for its quality and delicious taste. It is one of the major crops of the country. Actually, it is the major crop of the country, if I'm not mistaken. And it's the world's third largest uh, producer. And though it is not, coffee growing specifically is not that relevant in terms of GDP. And when I'm saying, stating this information, I'm basing myself on the IIOS from Colombia from 2015, provided by the Banco Nacional de la República. Uh, it plays an important role when it comes to employment as it employs over half a million families in directly, so potentially more benefit from it indirectly. Given the importance of this commodity, uh, climate change has sparked the discussion about how to overcome the coming hindrances imposed by new weather conditions. So these are the Colombian exports, as I mentioned, from the IIOS. As we can see in 2015, uh, coffee was the fifth most exported product and the first amongst agricultural projects uh, when it comes to value. So these are the destinations of Colombian coffee. As we can see, uh, mostly it's mostly imported by uh, developed countries so, such as the USA, Canada, Western Europe, Japan, and Australia. And these are also the, the oh, I forgot to mention, this is also 2015. Uh, and these are the exports of, co uh, of coffee in value all over the world on the same year. And as we can see, Colombia is the third largest exporter, second only to Brazil and Vietnam. So there's a catch here. Vietnam produces only um, not uh, Robusta beans or Canephora beans, and Brazil produces um, Arabica beans, same as Colombia. And even though Brazil produces uh, more than, than double its, its quantity, when it comes to quality, there is, I don't know if Federico may, might correct me, but from what I've learned and studied from uh, coffee growing, there is a catch, there is a difference between Colombian coffee and, and Brazilian coffee, as much as it pains me to admit that Colombian coffee has, has higher quality. And why does this happen? Because 
even though it's the same species, the harvesting um, process is uh, fundamentally different. So uh, the, the, on the same branch of a coffee tree, you have different size of, sizes of fruits and different ripeness. So Brazilian process basically just takes them all out, all out at once and roasts them all together. Whereas in Colombian coffee, they separate those fruits by size and ripeness, which makes uh, its taste su substantially better. So what happens to Colombian coffee in a climate changing scenario? I chose this picture from the Climate Institute because it's a schematic that uh, illustrates what happens to and what are the many different channels with which uh, climate affects uh, coffee productivity. So first, there are increased droughts and a more, more frequent, um, I'm going to say intensive um, climate phenomenon, as well as uh, advancing pests that stress the plant. Also, there is risk of deforestation that, so that will oblige um, coffee as, as well as other crops to migrate from the regions that they are being, being planted today. So as I said, rising temperature damage beans, increasing drought cut yield, and advancing pests uh, stress the plant. So these are the, those RCP, those represented concentration pathways from the IPCC uh, scenarios for, for emissions. In each one of them, even in dramatic emissions cuts, we see that uh, coffee land, specifically for Arabica beans, which are Colombian beans, uh, will experience a sharp decrease in farm, farmable land. This is, uh, this uh, actually, this paper is cited uh, by Federico also on his manu manuscript. Um, he depicts a general idea of what happens in coffee worldwide uh, when it comes to climate change. And so this is a, a picture that shows uh, the regions in which uh, Canephora beans and Arabica beans are being planted. As we can see, I don't know if you guys can see my mouse here, Colombia is entirely Arabica beans. Um, usually Robusta beans are usually planted here on Western Africa and mostly on, on, on Asia. That famous coffee from Indonesia, Kopi Luwak, it's actually a, a robusta bean. So this is what happens to this is what the suitability suitability for 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 growing for coffee growing, and as we can see, where here is the the Colombian region, and it's actually really really suitable for coffee. Not only again because of the the quality, but also because of the quantity that it yields. So this is what happens on scenario RCP6. So um, interesting, interestingly enough, uh, Colombia will experience, as we can see here on image A, uh, especially on the Andean region, will experience actually an increase in productivity, even though um, many, many studies regarding uh, climate change and, and productivity usually correlate negative, negative effects on, on crops. So this is the distribution of suitability by scenario in latitude, altitude, and region. And as we can see specifically in altitude, as it's gonna be playing a major role in the simulation, uh, for higher regions, which is the case of Colombia, they're gonna be experiencing actually an increase in productivity because they're gonna become more suitable for coffee. So, uh, so how do we sum all of this up and get net effects because I just mentioned a lot of channels with which co uh, coffee can affect productivity, but we don't know how much. So Federico actually uh, provided us with an estimation by municipality in which he actually concatenated all those models into one single estimation. And we actually asked him then to aggregate those results by department because given the CGE's model structure, we only have the, the least, the, the highest disaggregation we have in terms of uh, regionality is the, the, the Colum 33 Colombian departments. So he aggregated it for us and we use those, those estimates for the CGE model. So this is a schematic also provided by Federico in which he actually how to aggregate all of those models at once. So what are the results? First of all, how does the, the CGE model uh, works basically? So we're going to be shocking regions and sectors specifically. So the only sector that's going to be affected is sector two, which is coffee growing. I forgot to mention that in the input out, output system from Colombia, 
coffee, the coffee industry is separated into two uh, different industries. One, it, one uh, only considerates growing, whereas the other considerates roasting, grinding, and packing. It's called coffee processing. So the shock naturally only affects growing, as it's a climate change shock and affects mostly the productivity of the crop. And the regions are going to be affected differently, as we're going to see shortly. So as we shock, for example, I took this example, a re region five in 15.275, we're actually saying that this region is going to be needing 15% uh, more inputs to produce the same level of output. So there's an inverse relation here. So actually positive shocks are actually bad for the, for the economy as a whole. So what are the results here? These are the results aggregated by Federico. So uh, these are the regions that are, that are affected by, by a climate change scenario. Again, I specifically chose to, to highlight uh, positive values in red and negative values in blue because negative values are actually interpreted in the model as an increased productivity. So as we can see, it almost emulates the topology of the country. As you can see specifically here in this Andean region, we can see an increased uh, productivity and in this region here we can see that there is a strong decrease and this region actually it's is one of the the highest producers of coffee nowadays so these are the effects the the global effects of the simulation so once we, we inputted those those shocks in a computable general equilibrium model it has uh, all agents in economy have had their specific uh, equations in order to optimize and we let them optimize it so that we have a new um, equilibrium scenario. So these are global effects. So GDP is going to be experience, experiencing a 0.212% growth, and it's separated from the expenditure side uh, amongst those values. So just a quickly reminder here, the red values are actually changes relative to themselves, and the blue values are actually its composition into the GDP change. So for example, consul consumption is going to increase about 0.27%. Uh, those are the impacts, the same 0.212 impact on GDP, disaggregated by department. So we have, again, winners and losers. So as we mentioned here, for example, naturally the, the, the regions that experience the sharp increase in productivity are the biggest winner here, and the opposite is also valid. So we have a total positive impact of 0.271, whereas the total negative impact is of 0 0.059, which the sum of those values actually accounts for the total GDP change. We have uh, impacts on, on industry level, on activity level by industry. Uh, as we can see, processing of coffee products and coffee growing are the most affected, followed by real estate, manufacture of beverages and tobacco products, arts, entertainment and recreation, water collection, and processing of grain meal products. And even amongst the bottom 10 industries that are affected, most of them are still affected positively. So these are the changes in gross regional project, product. Uh, again, we see the same pattern here being emulated only with a, with a, less, less, strong, with a less strong effect as we, we saw for the, for the shock itself. So again, uh, Huila, Tolima, the Central District and Cundinamarca are the ones that are most benefited by it, and Santander and Cauca and, and Hizarada and Quindio are, are the regions that are that are that are affected uh, negatively by it. So those are the impacts on factor mobility. So basically, labor and capital. As we can see, capital actually most uh, departments, except for a few, have an inflow of capital. Whereas in in, in interregion migration, we have the that same topology pattern repeating itself once more. So what are the conclusion here? Uh, it is important to know that though those macro results tend to be relatively small, which are consistent with uh, Federico's estimations, they're entirely heterogeneous between sectors and regions. Secondly, uh, coffee-related industries were the ones most affected by the shock, which is expected given this, the production structure of this commodity. And what I've mentioned already uh, throughout this presentation is that high plate has major role um, in, this, in this scenario given that lower regions will become unsuitable for coffee, whereas the Andean regions will experience a sharp increase in productivity. Another thing that I forgot to mention here is that the model is only considering a change in, in, 
and productivity for coffee, not all other crops. We're not taking into consideration, for example, the, the, the competition for lands that are gonna happen probably because of the of climate change, climate changing effects. So what are the next steps for this research? Firstly, we would like to introduce a more detailed analysis regarding difference between production quantity and quality. As I've already mentioned, uh, there is a strong quality component in coffee, in Colombian coffee. And we're not taking into consideration that maybe the coffee that's gonna be produced in higher regions has, a, uh, has less quality than coffee producing in lower regions. We're just taking into consideration total yields per hectare. So secondly, we would like to integrate stochastic model into into the CGE to deal with uncertainties. Naturally, we're speaking about the future and there's a lot of uncertainty uh, that comes with it. So we would like to use, for example, the standard deviation from, um, from Federico's estimation to, to input many different scenarios and gaps with which the, the results can vary. And finally, we can also input land as a specific primary factor, which is not also done in the model as we have. So, this is it. I tried to rush a little thing in order not to get over my 20 minutes. I hope everything was clear. Yes, Pedro, thank you so much. Muito obrigado. Uh, very interesting work. Let me um, uh, say, share a comment with you and then I have a question for you. So my comment yes. is, um, I get the feeling that the IRIO system that you use here across those um, large entities in Colombia, if I remember well, it is based on volume. Uh, this is how I believe that IRIO system was set. It turned out that with uh, another PhD student here from Colombia in, in a department, uh, we've been able to um, make a cross correlation between the international price of a commodity as it is being exported from Colombia and the volume of each commodity that is going from uh, location I to location J. So as a result, we have now a very fine database of uh, intermunicipality trade. It's not an area system, it is just trade, but it is still very fine. And I wonder if there is any interest to eventually combine that information with the area system you have. So we need to carry on with that conversation. So it's more of a comment. Uh, my question is mostly on a point that uh, even with the work with Federico, we did not really have much chance to tackle. Uh, which is what kind of adaptation strategies you think that uh, the uh, you know coffee producer might be the most inclined to use in the face of the changes in in climate that you have highlighted? Okay, so actually uh, I forgot to mention. Thank you, uh, Federico, for sending me. He sent me an email this week. I have a lot on my plate right now, but uh, it's certainly on my radar to take a look into it. Because I'm using the manuscript he actually wrote on August 2019, and he actually sent me the, the updated version. I have to take a deeper look into it. But as, as I said, actually, the model is, is just giving um, some strong insights about which regions and sectors are going to be impacted positively by it. So firstly, it would help a lot if we integrated the stochastic model. It is uh, on my... And, and mine and Professor uh, Eduard, uh, Eduardo's uh, radar to, to integrate the stochastic model into the, into the CGE because it's gonna give us a, a, a broader perspective as uh, what are the worst case scenarios, for example, for, for this simulation. And as we, we, are, we are integrating those, those, those tools into the, into the analysis, we're gonna be providing more, more specific, more precise um, precise estimations regarding the productivity. With this, with those estimations, I think uh, authorities can rely on, as I, again, as I said, we're not taking into consideration everything. A, a, a perfect model, for example, uh, would consider all productivity changes such as, I don't know, what would happen, for example, for uh, regarding Brazilian canes, for sugar cane, for example, because those things, they interact with each other in a general labor model. And with the model we have today, we don't take this into consideration. This is a limitation of the model. With, if were we to take th this into account, for example, not, maybe not necessarily everything, but most of it, for example, most of it in terms of, of, of volume, uh, the model would certainly become more powerful. And then those, again, those estimates would become powerful um, inputs for, for policymakers in order to make decisions. 
I, I hope I, I yeah very good yeah thank you so much Pedro why don't we collect more uh, comments or question I see that Nori uh, has a question so Nori why don't you ask it please yeah um, thank you very much for the questions uh, they give me the chance to ask questions so my question is uh, I saw your chart on the export share and I see the high numbers of the EU and I assume those are the uh, kind of a uh, uh, coffee bean pack, packaged coffee beans. Is that mean those EU countries have a higher value added when they sell the export? And it's related to that uh, from the trade policy perspectives. If I understand correctly, the most countries import duty is high for packaged beans or roasted beans rather than the raw materials from Colombia, Brazil. Um, do you have such a uh, uh, simulation mechanism in your global model to differentiate the intermediate and final products? I don't, but there is a thing that I forgot to mention now that you asked. Uh, Colombia doesn't export uh, in natural beans. Differently from Brazil, that uh, Brazil exports uh, also in natural beans as, as well as processed beans. So for example, uh, we have a lot of countries, let, let me go back just a little bit. Uh, chart we has here. So we have, for example, Germany exporting 7% of world trade value of coffee. And naturally, Germany doesn't plant a lot of coffee. So this is re-export naturally. So Germany imports coffee from places such as Brazil, roasts it, packages it, and then re-exports re the same product. Colombia doesn't export in natural beans. So no other country is actually re-exporting Colombian beans. But, I don't have, but we don't have this distinction in the model, within the model. I don't know if I made myself clear. Yep, thank you. Very good, thank you so much. Uh, more questions, more comments yeah. for Pedro? Yeah, uh, Pedro, this is Jeff Hewings here. Uh, thank you for a nice presentation. Um, I don't know whether you're gonna continue with this work, but it occurred to me that uh, one of the most interesting aspects that you highlighted was one, the heterogeneity across space, and also the, uh, uh, the degree of dependence of uh, a huge segment of the population, about 1 million families, if I recall. And so I'm wondering whether you might wanna consider developing some sort of micro macro framework where you could model uh, the behavior of uh, those families, uh, representing samples from each of the various regions and look at their vulnerability to, uh, to this climate change. And this then would uh, enable you perhaps to elaborate a little bit more on the uh, labor market possibility, because I think uh, most of these folks are, are pretty well captive and do not have very many other alternatives. And uh, there is some precedent for this, some, some work by Laura Atuesta uh, developed such a mi micro macro model uh, looking at uh, migration uh, um, in, uh, in, the, in the Colombian case. And I think that uh, this would, um, I think, really enrich your, your work and as you think about future work, trying to get it published in major journals now, it's very hard to get CGE work published unless it has some innovation. So I'd be happy to talk to you some more about this. But thank you very much for a nice presentation. Well, firstly, thank you for your comment. Um, regarding the, this macro-micro-analysis, micro, micro, micro I think it is very relevant for the work. Um, as, as I said, the CG model takes into consideration um, net effects over uh, long periods of time. So it's not taken into consideration. So I used to have a professor that said capital is not exactly jelly. So actually we're not taking into consideration there is a strong intergenerational um, component here. People are not gonna be migrating so easily. So yes, yeah, certainly this kind of analysis would really enrich our, my, my work. Thank you very much. And I'd be happy to hear about the Laura you said, right? Yeah, Laura Atuesta. Well, Pedro, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. Uh, Joaquin, once again, thank you very much for your own presentation. I'm very thankful to both of you for finding some time for us. And we're going to leave it to that for today. And I hope to see all of you next week, ne same time and same place. Thank you so much, everybody. See you. Thank you, Sandy. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye, Jeff.